what are we, afternoon? Good morning. Morning, still in the morning. Uh, DC time, all right? Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Farzad Mostashari. Uh, with me is my, my friend and um, uh, successor uh, at the Office of National Coordinator, Karen DeSalvo. And uh, people say you should really choose your predecessor carefully in any new job. And Karen chose really well. I did. <laughs> because she looked great in comparison um, after, uh, after coming in as the US National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, both Karen and I have been in public health at the state local level uh, and then federal policy making. And both of us have experience um, with the private sector as well. Um, I started uh, Allidade. It's a company that helps uh, private uh, 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 primary care docs take on risk contracts. So uh, kind of helping them manage risk, which is a, a big topic for, for these days. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Karen to kind of summarize how she would kind of summarize her, uh, her uh, roles and experience, and then we'll get into uh, policy and innovation. Great. Well, you know, I remember when Farzad uh, called me to ask me if I would be interested in looking at the job, and, and I, I told him he had the wrong phone number. And, uh, but, I'm, but I'm delighted, actually, that I got to pick up some pretty terrific team that you, that you had assembled. And um, so I'm, uh, like you, a physician, practiced for a lot of years, and um, had a, a big shift in my career when Hurricane Katrina happened in New Orleans. And that uh, led me to a pathway of doing more and more policy work at the local level and then eventually the national level. But in our rebuilding, uh, that's how we got involved in health information technology as kind of an essential underpinning to all the work that we were doing for uh, healthcare and public health. And been out of government now for um, almost two years. It'll be two years in January and have been uh, enjoying some flexibility now, uh, being back in academics at the UT Austin Dell Med School, but also serving on the boards of some private companies and doing- um, Maybe you should mention a couple of them. Humana, um, and I'm on advisory board for Verily, um, and uh, I'm doing uh, uh, some work with the National Alliance to impact social determinants of health, which I co-convened with Mike Levitt, who's a former HHS secretary. Very good. Keeping me busy. So, um, so we're in, San Francisco, and this is kind of the home of the point of view that, you know what, if there are problems, we can solve them uh, through innovation, change the world, technology, um, and a little bit of a feeling, I would say, that government's too slow, too stodgy, if anything, regulatory capture, right, it's, it's in the pocket of the big companies, not for the disruptors, uh, and, uh, you know, plays into a little bit of a narrative yeah. of, you know, um, it's irrelevant, government policy is irrelevant at best for innovation and, you know, uh, harmful at, at, at its most skeptical. Right. So, Dr. DeSalvo, would you, would you want to take issue with that, with that characterization? I, By the I, way, anyone, does that, did that resonate with folks here? Did that? You all like do this, do this, if you think you agree with what I just characterized. <laughs> all right. You know, I, went, um, I was a really uh, frustrated with government uh, about the time that, that I was joining federal government, honestly, because I had watched um, some of it fail after Katrina. And so I have to be honest, I had a healthy skepticism. But what I learned uh, over the course of my time of rebuilding um, the, the health infrastructure in New Orleans and then uh, obviously being in, in government is it really does matter. Government has a critical role to play as a partner with the private sector. It's not the sole solution, but there are definitely things that the federal government or uh, local government can and should do because it, it has an accountability to everyone. Right in a way that you don't when you're in the private sector. And, and if, if nothing else for purposes of consumer protection or equity or certainly making sure that you achieve a policy goal of in health of everybody benefiting, I think there's a really important- Sounds like to socialism for, to me, right. Karen. It's not really designed to be socialism though. I mean, that, that, that's sort of what we're grounded on um, as, as a country when, when you think about um, things like education. 
uh, or access to roads. These are the ways that we have, have, have sort of a minimum or a floor uh, and make sure that that's then an opportunity for economic uh, uh, development or entrepreneurial uh, opportunity. And done right, that's exactly what you see coming out of Washington, whether it's in you know, drug policy or coverage expansion or technology policy. These are the ways that we try to spur um, and support the private sector, but it has got to be a partnership because it cannot only be government. So, uh, so let's get specific, right? We're talking about digital health and innovation. Um, you know, I've heard people say that, oh, the whole meaningful use, certified EHR thing, that was regulatory capture by the big vendors and it stifled innovation in uh, digital health. How would you, how would you, what would you say to that? Can I really answer this? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Answer it. Well, you know, so, so let me, um, so, you know, for those of you who aren't intimately familiar, the Meaningful Use Program was meant to jumpstart the private sector who had been dancing around the idea of creating a digital footprint of everybody's health. And it had been talked about um, and certainly pushed by the Bush administration. There was some work to use Medicare dollars to spur uh, that, that to happen, but nothing really um, significant. So was context, it was still 9% of hospitals yeah. had a basic electronic health record in 2009. Right. And, and so this legislation, this high-tech legislation that was written a little bit before then, um, was written in a time when there wasn't even a smartphone on the market. And so just to give some context for people, we were still thinking of a world of servers and software that you unwrapped, shrink wrap, you know, from a box and, and put a disk into a computer. And the world's changed a lot in, in, in 10 years. And I only mention that to say that we have to put ourselves in the shoes of people who are writing the legislation and doing the work, that, that it wasn't about the data as much as it was about the software. And so that, that push to offset the cost of adoption for the private sector to, to cause it to create a digital footprint was very successful. I mean, now 100% basically of all hospitalizations, there's data to tell the story of what happened. And in the outpatient setting, it's about 85%. So we're, we're pretty, we did this in a tremendous way as a country, and it was not happening until government stepped in with the Meaningful Use Program. I think in retrospect, though, now looking back in, in 2018, there's some things that we learned that, that probably would have been more helpful, like um, uh, really putting some pressure on the vendors to not have a lot of proprietary standards, to make it a more open system, and, and to make the data more readily available for the kinds of purposes that we want. But it's easy to say that when you're in, you know, this, in this world, when we're thinking of all the important uses of the data, I, I think on balance it was a, a, a great effort because this, that's an example of the private sector of the market not solving an important public health challenge that matters for the whole country and government stepping in to sort of spur, to spur innovation. So um, what did government do? We made sure that it really was almost universal, right? So that's a, that's a big thing. that you know, market competing on its own isn't necessarily gonna, gonna solve, particularly um, when it's, it's not solving this very specific business problem right. that people had at that time. So there is now digital data available, so that's great. Um, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs say, well, why can't I just get it? Why can't I like go to any hospital in the country, and I want to be able to plug my app into their thing, and surely these open APIs, these fire standards, that's going to just, it's going to be open, and I can just plug my app in. Yeah. No? It's not happening everywhere yet. It should. And, and I, I want to tell this story um, that, that I know you know well, which is, I think, a great example of how government and private sector can work together well. But now we're at another place where probably government needs to step in more. And so the, the, the story um, essentially has to do with APIs. And, and you know, around the time that um, fire as a standard started to get real hot, huh? no pun intended, I'm sorry, um, um, I, that, that there was a report that was done by these scientists called the Jason Scientists. And this is like some of the smartest people in the country who come together in the summer in an undisclosed location that have been doing this since the Vietnam War to invent things like radar. And for the first time, um, the, my predecessors, you actually, I think, uh, uh, commissioned this work by the Jason scientists to figure out how we could 
open up the, the electronic health records to make the data more available. And think about interoperability not as point to point, but as the data being more liquid. And so that report came back to us from these scientists who hadn't been involved in health information technology, but were rocket scientists. And they said, well, this is easy. What you need to do is take this idea of APIs from other sectors and essentially apply it to uh, health, health data. And FHIR seemed to be a, a relatively easy way to do it. So uh, in, from government, we used our, our um, uh, advisory commission to create a task force to look at this idea. And I have to tell you, there was a lot of resistance. We got a lot of pushback from the, the vendors, the health information technology vendors and others, saying, no, you cannot just put holes in, holes in the, the data architecture and just let it free flow onto the street to be used by anybody for any purpose. I'm like, well, yes, we can. And I want you to try to figure out if, that's a, if that is, is a, a good thing to do. And over the course of time, that led not only to the report, but then to the Argonauts, which some people might be familiar with, which is a purely private sector effort of a bunch of really innovative people who now have embraced this idea that um, we can go better, smarter, cheaper, faster than we have been in standards and in interoperability, and they're being supported by some trust frameworks, which is the other piece I wanted to mention, because the technology is but one piece of how um, government can help kind of spur the private sector to move forward. Uh, we have also been working to spur um, the trust idea, because once you create a lot of doorways to the data, bad actors want to get that information and may use it for nefarious purposes. It's not all happy, good stuff. I mean, there are people who can get harmed. And so understanding um, how to create um, the proper allowances for keys, my gosh, that sounded so like policy wonky. Um, but, but these are the kinds of things where I think we set a really nice tone, uh, at least I hope, to, to help the private sector kind of figure that out on their own. I would just tell you personally, though, um, for all that good work, um, I'm going through an experience with a family member who it's like practically impossible for uh, uh, us to, for him and, and, and me with him to get the, the health information that we need, even in spite of all the good policy and Are you like, statutory. do you know who I am? Yeah, basically, I'm about to actually call the inspector general and tell them who I am. And, and because, it, because uh, it, I think that because it is now the law and it's also in rule that that data needs to be shared, but the private sector hadn't quite caught up to the idea. And they need to really understand that, that the world has changed and consumers have an expectation that they can pull their data together on their smartphone, not just have to go through a portal to a single hospital. Yeah. I, I think there's, um, there's a big assumption that private actors acting to maximize their profits are going to end up creating the greatest good for people yeah. without having government set the framework for what does success look like for you in a way that's aligned with success for society? And I think that's the piece that good policy aligns private incentives to make money yeah. with what's actually good for society. It's, it's such a, an interesting balancing act. And, and if anybody ever has the chance to work in government, I, I would encourage you to do it for lots of reasons. But, but even as an entrepreneur, it gives you this sense about how you're always trying to balance um, raising the floor and pr providing those protective guardrails, but not getting in the way of innovation, not creating a ceiling. And, and so you're, you're constantly trying to adjust the dial on creating a lot of flexibility in rulemaking or in, in statute, but then make sure that you're protecting, protecting people along the way. I think the other thing, Farzad, that you probably would appreciate really well is the arc of rulemaking. And I think this is a disconnect sometimes between entrepreneurs and the West Coast and what happens on the East Coast. Uh, so for example, in my inbox this morning, um, there was a, a super geeky email about the regulatory calendar for health and human services for the coming year. And it's all the things that they're going to think about rulemaking around. And those are the things that, the, that Washington people pay attention to. And it's a preview of not only the next 12 months, but really the next five years. Because when you start to think about uh, making policy in Washington, it's a many year timeline. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. So there's a lot of opportunity to inform and adjust and course correct. But if you leave Washington to do it on its own, it doesn't necessarily understand what the private sector is already innovating around. And that's why in technology, sometimes policy gets, get, gets in the way of innovation if they're not careful. Because innovation in the private sector is happening faster than policymaking can happen in Washington. Yeah. Uh, we have a bunch of questions, but uh, many around this theme of, OK, given where we are today, right? we did some things. There are certain standards that are in there now. 
there's uh, certain requirements. What is the like, one thing that you would suggest for the administration today that can help take us to the next step in terms of free the data? You know, um, I think they're doing a lot of good things, actually. And uh, part of that is because there's a continuity of policy. Yeah. Um, what what I, I always felt was really missing um, were two things. I'm not going to pick one, um, but I'll go more into one of them. But one is the is creating the business case, mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean for creating new uh, new uses of the data, but actually for sharing of the data. And that's really about value based payment, and really about downside risk. And so, meaning that uh, um, you have to incentivize a health, the healthcare system to not only want to share its data with, with a partner, which they have really no reason to do unless they want the partner to share data with them because they want to know if the person whose cost of care they have responsibility for already had that test across town and they want to reduce, you know, reduce, reduce the cost of, of care. And so we were pushing pretty hard on moving to value-based care, essentially, and, and they're doing that in some ways now. And it's, it's, but it's just part of the equation because honestly, um, that's, a mo that's a mental model that health is best described by what's on the electronic health record. And I, I, I actually am increasingly of a mind that there's probably a pretty good footprint of somebody's health in claims data and in uh, other data sources about them, either self-generated or, or contextual, like where they live and retail. We're learning that, that uh, pretty sophisticated analytics can paint a picture of somebody's health trajectory absent the EHR data. So it's almost making it a little less valuable in time, and that might make it more shared. But that's a pull issue for me. That's how do we, how do we just keep pulling the data that we have and telling the story of the health of people and communities and, and shift the power structure, frankly, so that the health system doesn't feel like it owns and controls all of that story. Yeah, people don't like it when you shift the power structure, yeah, Karen. Yeah, I'm all about that. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention uh, a couple of things that the administration actually has proposed mm -hmm. that I think are definitely you should, all should know about and you should support. Right? And this is, the, this is the important thing, is uh, it actually matters. Getting people who are uh, actually in the field trying to innovate, trying to work uh, to improve health for people to write into the policies and support things, the unpopular things that they're proposing is super important. Yes. So two that I'll mention. Okay. One, um, conditions of participation for Medicare. Yes. This is the nuclear option, Yes. right? This says if a hospital doesn't share information about that patient on discharge back to the community provider, they cannot participate in Medicare. This administration has proposed that. And I think, like, big kudos to them for doing it, and I hope they pushed all the way to the end. It was in our interoperability roadmap. Oh, I remember. Um, so, and, and I think this, but this is a really important point, and I'm going to let you get your other one, but that for this audience to know, too, which we sort of mentioned, which is I think you'll find in health IT policy there's a lot of continuity, continuity. policy. And, and, and Don Rucker, the current uh, uh, health IT uh, national coordinator, has said so publicly, and Seema Verma very similarly in the White House. So. There, that, that's good news for the industry, but this is an idea that's been brewing, and I'm 100% behind you. I think we should do this. It's not so much about the certification. It's about you cannot play in this game yeah. unless you're really doing right on behalf yeah. of patients. Patrick Conway and I proposed it in 2013, but we didn't get it in a rule. Yeah. And I think this is, this is where this is a big deal. it's a big deal. Uh, the, the, the second thing is, again, blue button, being a patients being able to have access to their own data, that being kind of the uh, Occam's razor that cuts through a bunch of, a bunch of kind of business model crap. Um, they've rebranded it kind of, Blue Button 2.0 or My Healthy Data or whatever. Uh -huh. um, but one of the things that uh, I really appreciate that they're doing now is that they're using their levers to push on health plans. Yeah to do the same. So there was a lot of levers that we had on EHR vendors and providers for patients, and it's still not there to be able to get their own data, but now they're saying it's gonna be in the MA call yeah. letter. Uh, Humana, I'm sure, is now thinking, like, how do we actually give patients access to their own claims data as well as the clinical data? And I agree with you, those two together are right. super powerful. Yeah, I, um, and, and agreed. 
it's, it's a really, you know, that claims data paints a, a pretty good picture of people's health and, and kudos to you for having the vision to start all that blue button work. It's, it's going through some nice iterations and I think it's getting a lot more sophisticated. The, um, the, this, this sort of gets to this idea of where's your, where's your longitudinal health record going to reside? And um, it, even in the last few years, that's evolved quite a bit to it's not going to necessarily be um, in, in the multiple portals that you have. We have this expression where we say we have hyperportalosis because now you have all these portals, but how do you pull all that together? And those trusted third parties could be your payer. It could be your bank. It could be um, a, a company that, that it is a NUCO that, that is a trusted, a trusted entity. There's, we're seeing lots of experimentation in the space. I haven't seen any banks yet, but I'm, I throw that one out there because I trust them with my money. So I might trust them with my health data. But I think that's, gonna, um, that's a power issue again. So if I have, as a, as a consumer, all of my health information accessible to me and I can share it as I deem appropriate, not only with my clinician, but with research or with public health as examples, that really then I create creates not only an opportunity for me to be more driving for my own health, but driving things like the research agenda for the country and helping to find cures. So this is a really exciting development and, and I, I think making sure that if you all support those kinds of ideas, both of them, I agree with you, you gotta write in. It's not just things that you don't like, because if you don't write in, then they don't ha they have 20,000 things saying this is bad, and one thing saying it's good, but they need 20,000 saying, yeah, this is good, free the data, give people the power that they should have. That should be the most liked tweet from the session. It won't be, <laughs> but that's really important, the idea of actually participating yeah. in that rulemaking regulatory it's your democracy process. In democracy. In it. Um, we have a lot of questions around uh, health equity, vulnerable populations, um, uh, social determinants of health, homelessness. Obviously, it's, it's such a huge issue in San Francisco these days. Um, Dr. DeSalvo, uh, you give us, that? I'm just teasing you. <laughs> give us, Dr. DeSalvo, give us your um, uh, analysis of social determinants of health and medicine and how medicine is coming to grips with social determinants of health. Uh, and what it means for vulnerable populations. So I'm going to go to William Osler, uh, who, for those of you not in medicine, is somebody that those of us in medicine really revere uh, as the doctor who taught us the importance of physical exam, et cetera. And his quote, which is, the good doctor uh, treats the disease, the great doctor treats the patient who has the disease. And um, absent calling somebody a patient, it's that idea that it's not just about the diabetes, it's about the person. And that person has a life and a place that they live it. And that, not only in a slice of time, but historically, their past and their future is are their social determinants of health. It's the kind of access they have to capital or to better education. It's, it's whether they have a social infrastructure that supports them, uh, whether they live in a safe community or have good air quality. It's the, those, that array of things that um, we sort of intuitively know affect our health, and in fact, it's 60% 60, 60 of your health outcomes, 60% dwarfing the 10% that healthcare uh, drives. But we spend all of our time and money on healthcare. So for me personally, if you can't tell, I'm very passionate about it because not only as a doctor and a public health person, um, but just as a citizen, frankly, I, I, I really think we got as a country understand that we can't get to health unless we understand people's lives and where they live it and how we use the partnerships um, to really think through creating healthier environments and giving people um, access to the kind of supports that they need. If you write somebody a prescription for insulin for their diabetes, that may be the right medical care, but if they're homeless, it's not really helpful because they don't have a place to store it, right? So these are the kinds of um, uh, exciting policy conversations that are beginning to happen in Washington. Not, not so much because it's a happy, good, social mission white hat thing, to be honest, but because there's mounting evidence that it drives down costs and it improves health outcomes. Um, so to be successful as a health system, it's increasingly clear that you can't just treat the diabetes or heart failure perfectly. You have to also find out if they have a place to live or if they're going to bed hungry. And I'm excited. Is it a good thing for hospitals to be paying uh, for housing for the ex most expensive patients? Is that because we're spending all this money on healthcare, we should take some of that money for healthcare and spend it on housing and food and transportation. Yeah, talk about a power struggle, right? So this is um, 
this is going to be an, a, a really interesting policy debate that, that will evolve. And the way it's going right now, Farzad, is that the Congress and the administration and most leaders in the space are thinking that, that we will essentially medicalize mm -hmm. the social determinants or mm -hmm. social care. So think about, think about it um, as, well, we'll use food as an example. So if um, uh, grandma's going to bed hungry, uh, grandma's choosing to buy food or cheaper food that may not be healthy for her or she doesn't have enough and she's not buying her medication and she's going to end up back in the hospital and that's going to be expensive to the system. And that's so, what we really care about is expense to the system. Go on. I'm just calling it like it is. Um, and and uh, the, so, so, so maybe Congress cares that she um, went to bed hungry. I'm going to give them that. But also Congress has a responsibility to the Medicare program and as such, gave some flexibility to the Medicare Advantage programs to be able to use Medicare Advantage dollars to buy food for people who might be going to bed hungry. So that's a downstream kind of address the social need approach. It's very good, very exciting, lots of work happening in the private sector with systems like Dignity, who was just on the stage, or Kaiser, or small systems like Ballot Health. Um, we could, the list could, goes on, it's a bunch of small FQHCs, very active in identifying social need and addressing it for individuals. And in some cases, being given the flexibility to use Medicare, sometimes Medicaid dollars, and in the private sector, they're experimenting with commercial dollars also. The, um, the bigger question is, should we be, as a country, not just transferring dollars from healthcare to social care uh, to buy Meals on Wheels food, um, but should we actually invest in making sure that people aren't at risk for going to bed hungry in the first place. So uh, is there some reason why we should be plussing up the budget, increasing the budget for our social care infrastructure, transportation, public transportation, housing, education? And there, uh, there are some very interesting models where health systems like Kaiser, who I will call out as I think a real leader in this space, are using their, their um, power as a civic leader to do things like help change the transportation routes in communities so that people, uh, they're not just providing ride, ride support to get to the hospital or the clinic, but they want those folks to ha be able to get to church or school or work or see their friends or whatever, have a life. And if they know, and they're, and they're paying attention to, the, to, to their opportunity to change the public transportation system in some communities. You see this in housing and Absolutely. food systems. Some businesses are doing it, like General Electric did it in Houston with the food system. So there is the world sort of our oyster to do it on a one-off basis. What, what I think we're debating in, is a maybe we're not debating yet, but I would like for us to, to debate as a country is, do we want to transfer after we've already budgeted it to health care, or is there a whole new way of, of social care? Let me just say this. I don't think this is all just do good either. And, and I, um, meaning, I want to do good, because I'm a primary care doc and I'm public health, so I think we all get that, right? <laughs> so, but on the other hand, I, I think there has to be a sustainable business model, and I'm pretty intrigued by all the innovation I'm seeing in the social services space. And rideshare is a really prominent example. So historically, if we needed to provide transportation for our patients, we would contract with a local transportation company or some, some such, or a cab company. But rideshare stepped in and said, no, they raised their hand and said, we got this, and we'll give you a digital readout of everybody we picked up and where we yeah. dropped them off. And so now there's this digital enterprise that is providing social care, and I think food is quickly yeah. to follow, and, and there, may, there may be a lot of other yeah. innovation opportunity. Yeah. I, I, I do want to underscore, though, this key insight here, which is let's not pretend that either rideshare or hospitals paying for taxi vouchers is going to solve fundamental structural problems with transportation or housing. Right. And, you know, uh, instead of any, if there are any billionaires in the audience there, uh, instead of, you know, giving money to some, you know, homeless shelter, like make sure that Prop C gets passed, right? Getting fundamental change and making sure that influence is felt on, you know, hospitals can barely do health care. To ask hospitals to also become like experts in housing, whereas like we actually have experts in housing who are saying we need to invest 
a lot of money in housing. So this is what my concern about social determinants of health and, and medicalizing that exactly as you said is, like, let's not pretend that it's a substitute for actually funding the social safety net. That's right, because we're, it's like trying to fill the bathtub with the stopper out, and we'll, 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 never, we'll never get upstream and be able to solve it. And, and the, the, if, for those of you that are not tracking on this, I, I want you to know that life expectancy in the U.S. is declining for the first time in generations. And there are some populations more impacted than other, but that is, others than, but that is a global number. And so this is no longer sort of, oh, those people, those populations, those individuals, those communities are struggling. It's pulling all of us down. So if you have any reason that you don't think that, that we're all interconnected, I want you to understand that we really are. And you see that even at the individual community level. Communities where there are wider disparities, um, there are, there's, there's a lowering of the mean life expectancy or, or worse health outcomes, but where communities come together, whether they're small places like a Birmingham or places like San Francisco, they're able to actually start closing the gap and, and raise the mean for everybody. So there's a, a distinct interconnectedness and a reason that we have to use big policy levers to make change for our community's health. Yep, agree. Public health people. Were. What are you worried about? What are the things that, that worry you from a policy yeah. point of view vis-a-vis -vis innovation? I worry about a, a lot of things. Um, I, I worry that, uh, that all the good work we did for data liquidity and freeing data will cause some um, uh, harm to people because cybersecurity is not attended to or we allow the data to get in the hands of nefarious actors. And that, gets, that's a little, that has to do with things like meaningful informed consent. Uh, but I think it's also about a professionalism on the part of the private sector to, to be responsible for how, we, how they create a way to identify trusted apps and trusted data repositories. That's not a government's job. I think that's, and it's something happening. In a way that doesn't become a fig leaf yes. for yes keeping data in and hoarding data and, and blo information block. Oh, that's, and that's the truth too. I, I think there's a lot of excuses about, about hoarding Privacy. data. So we have to, I think we have to make good use of the, of the opportunity that's on our doorstep and do that not only for financial gain, but for social gain. And I, I, I think you can do good and, and uh, do well at the same time. We see lots of good models. I think the other thing just predicated on our conversation about social determinants is that we're gonna wake up in a few years and it's gonna have been a fad and people go, oh, remember when we went to all those conferences or we did all those things and we talked about the social determinants of health and, and not, have, not have done a proof of concept or created a value proposition around really addressing not only social need but going upstream and, and really changing policy. And we're at a moment as a, we are at a, moment as a country where the, the financial pressure that's going to come out of Washington, trickle to the states mm -hmm. and to all the health plans to fill our budget gap. Yep. Is going to mean we're going to have to do the same or do less with less in healthcare, and that's going to create more pressure, more stress and pressure on all the social needs people have. And I don't want some of the most vulnerable in our community to get left behind in that equation. So I think we all need to wake up, pay attention, be engaged at the local level, not just the. To your yep. point, it's about local policy as well, and and not federally, and and not think about social determinants as a conference topic, but really as a meaningful way that we have to be civically engaged to really create the kind of vi vital communities that we want. A uh, lot of innovation happening. How do, you know, a lot of little gems of innovation yeah. that, are, that are occurring. Do you see a, a way to get folks, how, how folks can think about bridging from that spark to kind of a sustainable burn? This keeps me up at night too, and which is to say that the the sort of fad piece, but but it, it, it's compounded by the fact that we have a lot of great innovation happening, but there's not a sh a way to share uh, that information to spread it or to scale it, and I don't actually have a great solution for that to be honest with you. I, I'm excited that everyone's so interested in um, moving to value and in trying to really get it from being a something the CFO barely pays attention to in a health system, but to really start thinking seriously about, about how we're gonna spend money in this country for better outcomes. Uh, but I also uh, think that to the same degree that we're understanding that health is more than healthcare, we're gonna have to find a way to be more coordinated about, about social care. And this is like, there's no great answer to this, um, except that um, I'll, I'll say this, what I hope is we do a better job at, as a country of not only reporting out our successes, 
but mm -hmm. we're honest about our failures because yep. one of the things I see, especially at the everyone's local crushing level, it. Yeah, everyone the, here is crushing yeah, everyone's it. Everyone's is all perfect, right? We're all yeah, crushing it. Not, and and it, the more we learn from each other's mistakes, uh, the, the less likely we're going to be repeating yeah. these mistakes on the local level. And I see quite a lot of that, yeah. where a community doesn't even understand that someone's already tried said solution, yeah. and so they're trying to, yeah. to, to reinvent it, it all over again. And it's kind of whole death by pilot thing. Yes. Right? Of of like everyone's willing to do some little thing for yeah. a little money because it's kind of their innovation agenda, and you went in through their chief innovation officer or whatever, right? Uh, but it's not really part of their core. It's not solving a problem for the business. Right. Um, and I, I would just urge everyone to like work on big problems. And if that means you have to join you know, a slightly larger company to work on a big problem, like that's OK, or go work for the government, where you can have actually, honestly, the biggest impact um, and, and make change. I think that's scale, really, as they say. Scale. Good, scale. No, I think that's really true, and 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 you, meaning that the the scale. It's like issue. a really big GoFundMe, <laughs> where everyone puts money in, and we fund like housing and stuff like that. It's called government. <laughs> Shared resource. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the. Um, the Yes, um, I think I think finding a way to be a part of something bigger than yourself, whether it's an organization um, or an effort. I would say also um, that we have to kind of uh, convince the green shade people a little more about the kinds of work we're doing. And what I mean by that is, and I'm talking very specifically about health. We, we struggled with this with health IT. I don't think we've shown yet the value of, of health IT. It's intuitive that you should not be on paper. But, you can. And as a, as a person who watched all of our medical records turn to wet bricks when Katrina happened, I can tell you we don't want to go back. But on the other hand, we in Louisiana. But on the other hand, I think people are still grappling with whether it's an investment that was worth having because they haven't figured out how to use the data, I, I think, in, in smart enough ways yet. I, that that um, sort of is related to the problem of social determinants. And, and, and I'm, I, I'm sorry to use the catchphrase, but I think it's a really important, uh, c uh, since it's 60% of health outcomes, and the government's trying to figure out with their actuaries what's the value. I think once they can show us that if you make sure someone doesn't go to bed hungry, there are savings there, those savings can be shared by, however, by the solution set, which probably shouldn't come from the traditional healthcare system, but is going to be an entrepreneurial solution set and maybe a new social care system that is a whole new set of yep. businesses and, and opportunities. Yep. But we don't have a way to, to show that value yet. And, and that's a, um, I, 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 I hate talking about actuaries in public, or but I love talking about actuaries in public because they're kind of the cornerstone. The way we think about paying for everything that we do in healthcare is very predicated on the way they, their, yep. their models. And until we can help them understand that there's more to health than healthcare and, and that they're gonna have to evaluate that. And they're trying um, at CMS, but we one, have a lot of work to do there. What, one of the biggest things that um, innovators face is um, monopolies don't like new entrants. <laughs> Uh, the feeling is shared, right? Feeling is mutual. Um, and I worry, particularly in healthcare on the provider space, that lack of mm. competition is not going to, is like market based solutions can't work if you have a monopoly who's squeezing every, everybody else out. Uh, what do you see as the biggest kind of competitive threats or anti competitive behaviors that kind of big monopoly providers, and there are a couple of them in the area that maybe folks have heard of? Um, feel free to name them. Um, oh what they can, what they have, uh, what are anti-competitive behaviors that government has to address if they want the market to be able to flourish and work? We have a minute and thirty-six seconds. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that there, that is absolutely an important balance, and it's all parts of the market. And when once they begin to consolidate, there's less competition. It's not just about price and money; it's about service. I'm going to use my example from from my time in New Orleans. After Katrina, when we were building a, a new community health infrastructure, when I say new, we'd never had. Was it Oshner? We'd never had. Okay, I'm gonna go there. We'd never had one, and uh, it had all been emergency room care for the 250,000 uninsured folks that we had in our community. And so we built a, um, a, a primary care mental health infrastructure that lives to this day and is very solid and doing great. But when we were building it, 
there was debate in the community about whether it should come flow out of a hospital mm -hmm. and be sort of cookie cutter. And there was a hospital CEO that I will not name who said, well, we can do, we can make a prettier clinic than that thing that y'all have built there where I literally had built a clinic with borrowed furniture because we were doing it with two nickels and some friends. But the care that we were delivering was we were recognized as a patient-centered medical home by the National Quality Commission for Quality Assurance. So nationally acknowledged for quality care, doing it very affordably, but most importantly, doing it with a very community-facing and partnership model. And, and I really resisted as a leader in all that work having a cookie cutter model where every clinic would be the same and I wanted there to be these 20 different organizations that were competing because every time there was a consolidation, even in our tiny market, I could feel uh, the change in access and in, and in cultural appropriateness, et cetera. So these little subtle ways that you start to feel like you're the big player mm -hmm. and you don't have to really engage with the customer, call it your NPS mm -hmm. score, whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it now. And, and so we really, we did not even want Charity to be the, the leader in all of it, Charity Hospital. We really wanted to have some competition on the front line so that the people that we were serving would be able to choose and, and tell us whether we were providing the service that was needed. So I'm a believer in it, in the way we did it in the local market, and I've lived through that for about 10 years of watching how that, that market change uh, happens. On the other hand, there's a balance. So I'll just end by saying you can't have like lots of tiny because there's not efficiency um, and, and, if, and necessarily at that, at that scale. So we just have to watch that closely, but I do hope competition stays. Maybe independent practices can be brought together in a virtual a network idea. using technology <laughs> as a base. Thank you so much, Thank Karen DeSalvo. Thank you.